Well, good morning. Welcome to Duncan Road Church Live. It's good to see folks in the building, and we give a special welcome to everyone who's watching online. You'll notice a different camera angle. We got a little problem with the uh, cameras this morning. Hopefully, they will all work throughout the service, but uh, just bear with us. Uh, we did ask Boris Johnson to do the PA, and look what's happened. Now, we're grateful to the PA guys. They do a fantastic job, often goes unnoticed, and they've been working well to get us live this morning. So thanks to Josh and Dave. We appreciate your input. It's good to have Hannah and Rosie with us. They're going to lead us in a live song in a moment. Before that, uh, we're used to signs, aren't we? We're used to signs. I came across these signs that uh, humorously people have put on, on various places. On the door of a maternity room, someone had put the sign, push, push, push. Over a chiropodist door was this sign, Time wounds all heals. A sign on a dog owner's fence read this, salesman welcome, dog food is expensive. And in a veterinarian surgery, the sign read this, back in five minutes, sit, stay. And it got me wondering, what sign would we put over Duncan Road Church this morning when people are coming through the door? And uh, I was going to have the sign, um, build bridges, not walls. And later on, you'll see how that fits in with the message. But actually, I've gone back to the most obvious one. We just put the word love, love for God and love for others. That's what we're about, aren't we? If we claim to know God, that has to evidence itself in how we behave and treat others. And it got me thinking, it's easy to love generally, isn't it? I can love the people of Moldova. And uh, as a church, we recently gave a gift to help the work in Moldova. I can love the people of Southampton and the, the, the homeless work that goes on. And as a church, earlier on in the year, we gave a gift towards the work of the homeless. You can love generally because it doesn't actually affect you too much. Maybe your pocket, the wallet. But actually, the Bible says, love one another. And that's the problem, isn't it? It's the other the ones we have to interact with, that is the true test of Christian love. And Peter this morning gives us some insights on how we can love one another in a more genuine way. And we'll discover what that means later on. Well, we're here to worship the Lord, and it's good to have Hannah and Rosie who are going to help us with our first song, Come, People of the Risen King. Come, people of the risen King, who delight to bring Him praise. Come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace. From the ship. 
Thank you to Hannah and Rose. Let's link our hearts together in prayer, shall we? Let's pray together. We didn't have the words on the screen. That was uh, there somewhere. We don't know where, but they're somewhere. But uh, let me just read some of those words as a springboard for our prayer this morning. Come people of the risen King, who delight to bring him praise, come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace. Lord, we thank you this morning that it is good to bring our praise to you, the risen King. Lord, thank you that we are on the winning side, we are on the winning team, that uh, the victory is ours because Christ has conquered death, Christ has conquered the devil, Christ has conquered sin. And so we have a lot to rejoice in this morning because our greatest enemies of life have been defeated. And thank you, Lord, you call us to come. We are your people. We belong to you. And you uh, have chosen us, and you will keep us, and you value us. We thank you for that. Thank you that we who were not a people are now the people of God. We who had not received mercy have now received mercy. Thank you, Lord, that we who were in the kingdom of darkness have now been... uh, transferred into the kingdom of light. So thank you for that uh, uh, privilege which is ours this morning. And it's all because you are a God of grace. From the shifting shadows of the earth, we will lift our eyes to him. Lord, everything in this world is temporal. It will pass away. The old hymn says, change and decay all around I see. But thank you that we worship this morning the one who does not change. O thou who changest not, abide with me. Lord, help us to appreciate and experience the steady arms of uh, your mercy, reaching out to us, gathering us in. Thank you, Lord, that you are a God who watches over and protects his children. Lord, we can rejoice. We can rejoice. Let every tongue rejoice. This morning, Lord, we come uh, and we think of those who perhaps are mourning, those who are weeping through the night, those who tell of battles won and those who are struggling in the fight. Lord, we are a mixed bunch and you know our variety of needs, you know our weaknesses. Lord, we come this morning, give us strength, help us to find forgiveness afresh, help us to find strength for the week ahead. For his perfect love will never change. His mercies never cease and follow us through all our days with certain hope of peace. Lord, love, mercy, care, and what a promise that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Help us to find these uh, truths, Lord, to be anchors for our souls in these difficult times. Come young and old of every land, men and women of the faith, Come those with full or empty hands and find the riches of his grace. Lord, thank you that all are welcome. Age is not a restriction. Neither is nationality or social standing. You welcome us all this morning. We come on a level playing field. All are welcome because of your grace. Lord, fill us afresh, we pray, with a sense of your goodness towards us. Over all the world his people sing, sure to sure we hear them call, the truth that cries through every age, our God is all in all. Lord, thank you that this morning we join with millions of Christians around the world to bring our praise and our thanksgiving to you. We are part of one body. We are filled by one spirit. There is only one church. Thank you for this local uh, extension of your church. But thank you, Lord, that we all belong to that holy Catholic church, the true church made up of all believers throughout time and who have genuine faith in you today. So, Lord, thank you for this privilege to bring our praise and our worship to an almighty God this morning. Receive it, we pray, as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Penny, I'm going to jump on you because... uh, Mr. McCormack's going to be saved till next week because he's not working, but you are. So, Penny, over to you. Do you want the table in the middle? Yes, please. That 
camera there. Good morning. I'm going to share myself between the people here and the camera. So if I keep doing that, that's why. All right? Good morning, everybody. Lovely to have you here. Lovely to see you. Now, this morning, I've got some things with me, heavy things in there. But uh, you'll find out what those are in the middle in a minute. Can you remember what book we're looking at, children? What's the name of the man who wrote the book? Can you shout it out? Do you know it at home? Peter. Yeah, Peter. Well done. <laughs> Fantastic. That was from two sides. Excellent. Peter, can you remember where to find it? If you've got your Bible, see if you can find it. Quick. Start right at the back, remember? Right at the back. And you go through Revelation. Then you go through Jude, John 3, 2, 1, and then you get to Peter. Fantastic. And we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 2. And there's something very strange in this verse. Are you ready? Are you ready? Have you, have you got your Bibles open? Very strange indeed. And we're looking at verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. We're going to do little bits of those. And twice, living somethings are mentioned. Living somethings. Can you say, do you know what they are? If you can see it, living... Do you know at home? Joe knows, I can see it on her face. Go on. Stones, living stones. Stones. What a strange idea. Living stones. Do you know what? When Kathy was two and a half, we went to the beach. And she was two and a half, so she was only very little. And she found on the whole beach one stone. That was so special. It got a name. It was called Mr. Brown. And Mr. Brown came with us for the rest of the holiday and for weeks, no, months afterwards, didn't it, Cathy? Months. Mr. Brown had little beds and little houses and I'd find him in pockets and in boxes and on the windowsill. Every now and again, we'd be just to go out, about to go out and Cathy go, I haven't got Mr. Brown! I haven't got Mr. Brown! And we'd have to search everywhere for Mr. Brown the stone. Well, do you know what? Kathy's had Mr. Brown the stone for 18 years now. I think it's in her memory box. But do you know what? It hasn't grown any bigger. Huh? Hasn't learned anything. It's, it hasn't got any hair or... Uh, in fact, do you know what? I'm really sorry, Kathy, but it's not alive. It's not. It's just a stone. So what is Peter going on about living stones? Is he just being a bit funny? I don't know. Well, in the Bible, they use, there are lots and lots of picture language. Pictures which help us understand things which are a little bit tricky sometimes. Things about God and things about us and things about our church and how we should fit together. So, under your chairs, there should be a basket somewhere near you, a basket, and it will have in it some bricks. You need to get them out quick. You need to get them out because I've got a job for you to do. Are you ready? And you're going to need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I think. Nine. So if you make sure you counted nine out, you got them? Now, and at home, if you've got your Jengas ready, I did tell you. Are you ready? You've got to build the same structure as me, so you need to watch really carefully, okay? And this is one of the pictures that Peter uses to explain how important Jesus is. So you need to put three in a row, 
Can you do that? Three in a row. And then you've got to balance one across the top. So it's half on the middle one. Ooh. Have you managed that? You got that at home? Fantastic. Ready? Next one. Or oh, the next two. Next two. Are you ready? Oh, Joe, that looks great. Good, good. Fantastic. Grace, you're doing it? Oh, Mum's helping. Daniel's having a go. Lovely. Right, those two need to go. Careful. Don't let it fall. Don't let it fall. You ready? Have you done it? Nathaniel, if you come and get my extra bricks, you've got enough to do yours. Are you ready? So you've got one, two, three on the bottom. Take the bag with you. Take the bag with you. And there's plenty in there. Two above that and one across. Now, this is the really tricky one. Are you ready? This one has got to balance right on the top. <gasps> now, this is a picture that Peter uses. He says that Jesus is the most important part of the building. It could be, uh, he uses the, the, the word cornerstone, so it's like a really important stone. Which brick do you think is the most important brick in our structure? The one that if you take it away, it all falls down. Any ideas? Are you ready? This one here? That would work, actually, wouldn't it? But we might end up with one still standing here. I think if we take this one away, are you ready to try it? Take this one away here. Should we see what happens? On your marks, get set. Oh, let's do a three, two, one. Oh, oh, it's already gone. One, three, two, one. Oh! Yeah, that worked. <laughs> Jesus is the most important part of our building. And without him, we haven't got a church. But remember, it's only a picture. It's, oh, okay. It's the idea, the picture idea of, oh, you need one more, do you? You need one more. Okay, go on. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and that is one of the things that Peter is telling us. The other one, the other picture that he uh, is, is sh uses to show us uh, is how we fit, we fit together into a spiritual building, like our church family, how our church family fits together. Now, in your envelopes, put your bricks back in the basket for now. You need your big bit of card each, and you need the envelope with your name on it, okay? The envelope with your name on I've got Hattie's here. You're going to get yours later, Hattie. All right. Have you got it? Yeah, brilliant. Right, now what you need to do is open up that envelope. Just a minute, hang on. Wait. I'm going to show you what it looks like at the end. Are you ready? I've done a picture of a building, okay? And it's got all sorts of different shapes. Stones, big ones, small ones, wonky ones, ones with straight corners, ones with rounded corners. Because just like us, they're all different. We're all different shapes and sizes in our bodies and in our personalities and in our minds. But do you know what? God has made you just the right shape to fit into this church family. Because he knows you and he loves you and you are precious to him. Now you've got a puzzle. Don't get them mixed up because they're all different. So Daniel's puzzle, if you mix it up with Joe's, it's not going to work. Yours is individual to you, Daniel, okay? And I've given you a glue each. And perhaps over the next half an hour, you can put your puzzle together and find your name, because I've written your name, on one of the bricks. And what I'd like you to do is, is think who else is in our spiritual building, our church building, the building that makes up our Duncan Road Church family. And perhaps you could write other people's names on some of the other bricks. Maybe even you could pray for them while you're doing it. 
Hasn't God made us a beautiful spiritual building for him? Not because of anything we've done, but because he knows us and he loves us and he's made us just the right shape to fit in. Thank you. Let's uh, read the Word of God together. It'll be on the screen, and I'm going to invite you to stand while we do that, if you can. And uh, I think I'll read a verse, and you read a verse. Let's uh, be original, shall we? Peter writes, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Thank you. We trust God will bless his word. Be seated. Sorry about the strange numberings, but we went from chapter 1 into chapter 2. That's why you went from the 20s down to the 2s and the 3s again. Um, the chapter numbers and the verse numbers are not part of the original letter. They were added just for our convenience so we can zoom in on certain phrases and verses. Now, before we look together at God's Word, we're going to uh, watch and sing a song together. You can sing heartily at home. You can hum under your mass. And it's a song, Light of the World. And it's with Makaton Actions. Hopefully Josh will crank up the volume because when we tried it in rehearsal, it wasn't too loud. But I think this will be a nice version to watch or to take part in. It takes a few seconds to kick in.
Uh, we worship in song. Uh, we bow down. We align our will to his will. That's uh, true worship. And that evidence itself in our actions, how we live in the world. We worship God with our lives. Now let's pray and then we'll look together at 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22 to chapter 2 verse 10. Lord, we pray, open up your word to us now. Feed our souls, inform our minds, and dare we pray, change our desires and wills to conform to yours so that we might truly worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. Automatic binding bricks, 1949, that's what they were called. You and I, of course, know it as Lego. Lego. And uh, it's probably one of the most famous children's toys in the world. You've heard, we, we were wise. We trained our kids to play with pebbles and sticks. Much cheaper on the, on the finances. But some of you guys have spent a fortune over the years on Lego. Now, uh, Penny must be thinking on the same lines as me because I was tempted, and uh, COVID perhaps uh, prevented doing this, giving you all a Lego brick this morning when you came in. Not just so you could sit there and fiddle with it, but I was going to give you a challenge. And the challenge is this. I want you to build something with your Lego brick, but you cannot adjoin it to anyone else's Lego brick. Okay, so you've got one Lego brick. You've got to build something, but you can't use someone else's brick to help you. Do you know what you would have built? Nothing. Nothing at all. Because you can't build with just one brick. You need to put them together. And of course, that is a lovely picture of the church. One Christian living for Christ will not achieve anything significant or lasting in this world. Every Christian needs other Christians. That's why we are called the church. We work together. We fit together. We construct together. And therefore, we produce together. God has given us all different gifts and talents. And together, we are the church. Apart from being together, we are individual blocks that aren't going to achieve anything substantial or lasting. Now, talking about Lego, I don't know if you heard about the Lego lorry accident that happened this week on the motorway. Yep, a lorry that fell over. All the Lego was spilled all over the motorway. Apparently, the police don't know what to make with it. Boom, boom. <laughs> I apologize. You like that one, Boaz? One more for Boaz then, okay? If I have eight Lego bricks in one hand and 16 Lego bricks in the other hand, do you know what I've got? Very big hands. <laughs> okay, let's move on. You know, probably the very first thing you will build with a Lego set is a wall. Because when you put one piece to the other, you naturally make a wall. And probably is that a house or a construction is, is normally the first thing in which we build. Sadly, we live in a world that is constantly building walls instead of bridges. Uh, walls of uh, uh, social walls, economic walls, racial walls, walls that divide our world. But we're not called to build walls. We are called to build bridges. And there's a big difference. But with bridges come problems. The German philosopher Schopenhauer compared the human race to a bunch of porcupines huddling together on a cold winter's night. And he wrote these words, The colder it gets outside, the more we huddle together for warmth. But the closer we get to one another, the more we hurt one another with our sharp quills. God wants us to huddle together, to be together. But he wants to deal with those sharp quills so that we do keep each of us spiritually warm. But we're not causing each other spiritual pain. Now so far in our studies of 1 Peter, we've kind of walked in three ways. First of all, verses 1 to 12 of chapter 1, we walked in hope. That was the theme. Then in our second study, verses 13 to 21, we walked in holiness. Holiness. And now in our third study, the theme is walk in harmony, walk in unity, walk in harmony. And these verses really show four pictures of the church and how we are be, 
to be united. There's a lovely section in the middle on the person of Jesus. And if I had an hour to preach, I would gladly unpack it. You can find that study on the website where we looked at the names of Jesus as the cornerstone. So if you want that little portion unpacked, then have a little search on the website and you'll find it under a series uh, where we, I think we looked at the different names of Jesus. But this morning the focus is on our harmony, our unity, and we have this great example. Now first of all then, notice that we are children in the same family. That's verses 22 of chapter 1 to verse 3 of chapter 2. Children in the same family. You probably know the old ditty, don't you? Someone said years ago, to dwell above with saints we love, my, won't that be glory. But to dwell below with saints we know, now that's another story. And it's hard, isn't it, to put up with people that you know. You know the saying, you can choose your friends, but you are stuck with your family. And that is so true in Christian circles. Outside of church, you can choose to be friends with whoever you want, and you will choose people you naturally click and get along with. But in church, you're forced to get along with people that aren't your cup of tea. Some of them are quite irritating, and they rub you up the wrong way. And if you haven't discovered who they are, you're the irritant, okay? Okay. <laughs> Listen, that attitude is not acceptable in the church of Jesus. Stuck with your family. We are not to be stuck with our family. We are to love one another. The command is you go deeper than just putting up with someone or even accepting someone. Now remember from our previous studies, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1 reminds us, these Christians had been scattered by persecution. They were hurting, scattered. They had to leave their towns and their villages. Some of them had been quite isolated. They were forced to leave all their possessions at times. They, they were uh, going through, verse 6 says, a variety of trials. They had problems that perhaps we will never experience. Verses 14 and 15 says, some were tempted to conform, to compromise, or even give up. So they're scattered. They, they've got problems, they're going through trials, and they feel like giving up. To survive in those circumstances, you will not survive as a Christian on your own. You need others to support you, to keep you warm. You need community. You need genuine love. And that's why Peter is saying in these verses, we are to walk in harmony. And we are children of the same family. Notice he says two important things. First of all, we have all experienced the same birth. That's verse 22 to 23. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. So he says here, we are all born into the same, or we've all experienced the same birth. Years ago when I had a market stall at Fair and Market selling Christian books and Bibles and second-hand books, it was an outreach to the community in that uh, particular part of Fair Uh, I remember one of the other traders coming alongside me, working next to me. And he came over and he soon realized that I was different. I was selling Christian books, not secular books. And he said to me, uh, he said, I've just come back from New Zealand. He said, and uh, he said, I've come across religious people. They're called reborns. Have you heard of them? And I said, what what are they called? Reborns. They're, They're not just Christians. They're reborn Christians. And they take their faith really seriously. I said, I know exactly what you mean. But in the UK, we call them born again Christians. But I love that expression, reborn, born again. That's what the New Testament says. Every person who comes to faith is a reborn, a born again Christian. You had a physical birth when you enjoyed physical life. But when a person becomes a Christian, you will have a second start, a spiritual birth. And you become alive spiritually. For me, I was reborn or born again when I was about 17 or 18. I can pinpoint the very place, a field, 
a very wet and windy field in Dufferin, North Wales, when I said, oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Come into my life, change me. And God heard that prayer and turned my life around. But if you keep in, that, in, in your minds that, that illustration of being physically born and spiritually born, you can milk it a bit more, stretch it a little bit more. You see, to be physically born, you need two parents, a mother and a father. And to be spiritually reborn, you need two parents. The first parent in verse 23 is the living and enduring word of God. That's how you get saved, through the word of God. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Or the message of the gospel. We are saved because the word of God has life in it. So one of the parents in our spiritual birth is the Word of God. The second parent is the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus, in John chapter 3, put it this way, flesh gives birth to flesh. You had a physical birth, Nicodemus. And then he goes on to say, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You need to be born spiritually. It's a work of the Holy Spirit through the Holy Word of God in your heart, in your life. And Peter in chapter 3, 5 and 6 talks about the Holy Spirit. So God has given us a new nature, a new power, the indwelling Holy Spirit. And in verse 22, Peter says, Therefore, because you've got a new nature, you think differently to those who have just the old nature, those around you in the world. You will have a sincere love for each other. He goes on to say, a deep love for from the heart. So true Christian love is more than a handshake or these days a touch of the elbow at the end of a meeting. More than just a nodding smile across the distance. Our love is to be real, showing itself in attitude and actions. And then notice he mentions five specific sins in verse 1. These sins will always build walls between us and destroy love when we deal with them we build bridges and we express love therefore he says rid yourselves of all malice deceit hypocrisy envy and slander of every kind well let's zoom through them quickly malice is the desire to harm someone I enjoy Facebook and um, quite enjoy it uh, every so often you get random posts that appear And the search engine suddenly thinks that you need to see this advert or go to this website or see this post. And most of them you just ignore. But I've had a lot recently that come up, little video clips, and they're called payback. And I'm not quite sure why they're popping up. And the idea is someone's stolen someone's parking space. They're just about to back their car in and someone zipped in. So when the person goes off shopping, the person who lost the space pays them back by doing something horrible to the car. You know, it might just be wrapping it with toilet paper just to annoy them, or it might be something more harmful. And there's a load of these, and it just shows the culture that that kind of we're living in. Someone hurts you, you hurt them back, and hurt them back in a bigger way. Teach them a lesson. You deserve it. You've got rights, and they've abused your rights. Sort them out. Pay back. That's malice. Not in the church. In the church, some situations may need to be dealt with. We may have to say, look, this is wrong behavior. Let's get it sorted out. But it is dealt with an attitude of love and always forgiveness. We're not in the payback culture. We do good to those who harm us. We pray for those who persecute us. Malice builds walls. We're to get rid of malice. Deceit, deception, falsehood. The Greek word here means two-facedness or trickery. The idea is don't you know, bait on a fish hook. It looks enticing, but all the time it's designed to cause danger. It promises something nice, it delivers something nasty. The Bible says get rid of deceit. There is no place for deceit in the heart of a Christian and in the people of God. Thirdly, hypocrisy. It means to act apart or hide behind a mask. It's when we criticize someone for a particular behavior or attitude and then we go away and do the exact behavior or show the exact same attitude. Hypocrisy. And the strongest rebukes of Jesus 
in the Gospels were to the religious people, and he called them hypocrites. Hypocrites. Envy. Envy. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, said, he defined envy as pain at the sight of another's good fortune, stirred by those who have what we ought to have. They've got what we ought to have. One writer, Ed, Edwin, uh, Edward Gordon Selwyn, puts it this way, this sin is a constant plague on all voluntary organizations, not least religious organizations, and to which even the 12 disciples themselves were subject at the very crisis of our Lord's ministry. The night Jesus was going to the cross, they were arguing who's the greatest, who's the most important. They were envious of one another. Deal with it. And then the last one is slander. Slander. Always happens when the victim is not there to defend themselves. Always happens behind a person's back. They're not there to set the record straight. Slander is derogatory gossip. You know, we think COVID-19 is a virus. It's got nothing on slander. One person wrote this. Gossip is the deadliest microbe. It has neither legs nor wings. It is composed entirely of tails, and most of them have stings. What does Peter say? He says, rid yourselves. It literally says, take them off, as if they were old, smelly, dirty clothes. Get rid of them. You've got a new nature. You clothe yourself with the, the opposite of those things. So we have a new birth, or the same birth. We enjoy the same food, verse 2 to 3. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. You know, physical growth happens automatically. I can guarantee one thing. When you folks who are watching on the camera, when you next meet us in this building, you're going to say two things. You're going to look at the children and say, my, haven't they grown? And because you're polite, you're not going to say this, but you're going to look at each of us in this room and think, cool, they've aged, haven't they? And you know what? We're going to be looking at you and saying exactly the same thing in our minds because we're too polite to say, cool, you ain't after old during this year and a half of lockdown or however long it is or will be. Natural growth happens automatically in a good way or a bad way. But spiritual growth doesn't. To grow spiritually, you have to do something. It doesn't happen automatically. You have to crave. You have to feed on the Word of God. And you know what? If you haven't got an appetite for the Word of God, you've got a problem. If you're a Christian and you have no appetite for the Bible, you've got a problem. Because physically, when people don't eat... There's normally two things wrong. One, they are sick. When you're ill, you, your appetite goes. Or two, you're eating the wrong stuff. You've had a pile of sweets before your dinner and you don't want your dinner because you're full of junk. When you lose your appetite, it's normally those two reasons. You're sick or you're eating the wrong food. That is spoiling your appetite for the good food. And of course, there is a spiritual parallel there. If we are spiritually sick and weak, we won't want the Word of God. And if we're filling our bellies, our minds, our hearts, our spirits with junk, we won't want the Word of God. So Peter here gives two principles to grow. Verse 1, what to avoid. And verse 2, what to crave. Avoid those five sins and crave what is good, the Word of God. we better move on. He also says we are stones in the same building. We are children in the same family. We are stones in the same building. Verse 4 to 8. As you come to him, the living stone. William Andrew Ward wrote this. We can, to we can choose to throw stones, to stumble on them, to climb over them, or to build with them. Now the first three... Uh, uh, things in that quotation, throwing, stumbling, and climbing, again, we often see outlived in the world around us. They're on display before your eyes all the time. The last choice, building, 
Hey, that's what our new nature enables us to do. We are called to be living stones who build. Our lives make a difference. We are constructing something. Every day we live for Christ. Now he reminds us here there is only one Savior, Jesus Christ. Salvation is found in no one else. One Savior. There is only one spiritual building, one Catholic church. Not Roman Catholic. Catholic in the sense of universal, made up of all Christians throughout all history. The church is always complete. At this very moment, the church is complete. And yet, if someone becomes a Christian, it's still complete. It's amazing, isn't it? And the most valuable part of the church is the head. We're the body. If the head dies, the body dies. But the head's alive, and therefore we too are alive. And here's the incredible thing. Peter spells out for us the wonder of God's mercy, grace, and goodness. Because the description of Jesus is shared with us. Because he's the head, we're the body. He is precious, and we're told we are precious in these verses. Three times, verse 4, 6, and 7, Jesus is described as being precious. And in verse 9 and 10, three times, Christians are described as being precious. We are stones. Verse 4, 6, 7, and 8 says Jesus Christ is a stone, the capstone. But verse 5 says we too are stones in God's house. Do you know the problem with stones? They're all different shapes. You know, when this building was built, they built it with bricks that were almost identical. Same length, same thickness, same weight. And a building today, all the bricks are almost all the same. But in ancient times, they didn't have bricks like that. Or they did for certain buildings. Valuable buildings were used by, built by individual stones. Different shapes, different sizes. And it required a craftsperson to put them together. And God has chosen the odd-shaped stones that are in this building and watching on that camera. And if you come to faith, you are built up by the master craftsman to make his church. And not just stones, living stones. Verse 4, Christ is the living stone. And verse 5, we are living stones. Christ is the living stones, so are we. You know, Warren Worsby put it this way, every time someone trusts Christ, another stone is quarried out of the pit of sin and cemented by grace into the building. And Peter wrote this letter to people scattered to five different provinces, and yet he says you're all part of one building. Doesn't matter where you are, you're all part of one building, one spiritual house. So we are believers in the same building. And then he talks about our ministry, our ministry. I can uh, flick on, for the sake of time. We are priests in the same temple priests in the same temple verses uh, 5 and 9 of chapter 2 verse you are our living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood verse 5 says do you know if you go to a palace even to a museum uh, go anywhere expensive a posh restaurant there's normally someone outside checking you out and uh, there are guards at Buckingham Palace, and the riffraff stay out, and the important people get in. You want to go to a posh restaurant, there are bouncers on the door who weigh up your dress, realize whether you've got the cash or not, and say yes or nay, you're not coming in. Even bouncers on a nightclub look at their clientele and say, you can, but you can't. And in Bible days, there were priests at the gates of the temple who looked at the people and said, you can come in, but you can't. Or you could come into that bit, but no further. In other words, they're saying, what right do you have to enter this building? What right do you have to enter Buckingham Palace? You have no right at all, therefore you're not going to. I don't care if you're a British citizen. I don't care if you go to Duncan Road Church. You ain't going in. What right do you have to enter this building? Peter says, as a Christian, you have every right to enter the presence of God. He describes our standing, our status before God, 
in verses 9 and 10. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation belonging to God, the recipients of mercy. And then he describes your ministry. You are there to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his most wonderful light. You know, those words, verses 9 and 10, are, are almost identical to how God talks about the children of Israel in the Old Testament. We don't bring physical sacrifices like they did in the Old Testament. We bring spiritual sacrifices. Romans 12, verse 1 says, we bring our bodies as an offering to God. Hebrews 13, 5 says, we bring our praise as worship to God. Philippians 4.10 says we bring our material things as, as gifts to God to use. And Romans 15 verse 16 says we win people to Christ for his glory, the fruit of evangelism. Those are the sacrifices we bring to God. And then we better move on. Finally, he says we are citizens in the same nation. We are citizens in the same nation. Verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2. Three names in verses 9 and 10. A chosen generation. That speaks of the grace of God, doesn't it? We didn't choose him, he chose us. Long before we ever thought of him. We are a holy nation. We're set apart for his exclusive uh, use and to, to live exclusively for him. And, and the Bible says we are citizens in heaven. You know, citizenship... Take, take, take the example of Philippi, a letter Paul wrote a letter to. Philippi was a Roman colony. That meant geographically it was in Greece. But it was a Roman colony. So although it was geographically in Greece, they spoke Latin. Roman justice was administered. Roman magistrates governed. Roman dress was wore. Everything about the city was Roman. Even though geographically... It was Greece. We are citizens of heaven. Geographically, we live on planet earth. But everything, our speech, our ideas, our morals, everything we do and think should be because we're citizens of heaven. And then thirdly, he says, we are the people of God. We are the people of God. Once we belong to the evil one, we were in the kingdom of darkness. Now we belong to Jesus. We are in the kingdom of of light. And notice what he says just to finish verse 9. Why? That we might declare, show forth, to tell out his praise. You know, when you drive down the motorway, you, you're going along and you see a service station. It normally says services, petrol, and then you have a whole load of adverts McDonald's, KFC, Burger King. And those signs are designed to uh, appeal to your senses. To tempt you in. Full tank of petrol, but couldn't half murder a Big Mac. Full, full tank of petrol, but oh, that KFC, there's just, you know, something about it, isn't there? And, and it's designed to advertise and tempt you in. And even when you drive into a city, you see a sign, don't you? McDonald's, 100 yards ahead. And it's saying, look, this is what you need. Come on in and taste. Now, sadly, you have a KFC and you think, I can't find a chicken. That's the KFC. You have a burger and you think, oh, not lukewarm chemicals again. Ugh. It doesn't quite deliver what it promises. You know, verse 9 says, in fact, the word to declare, to show forth, is to advertise. We are to advertise for God. How do we do that? People should look at us and be tempted to want to know more. That's the idea. Just like when you see a McDonald's sign, you're tempted to go in. People should look at us and be tempted to want to know more. So in summary, four pictures. Four pictures. We are children of the same family. We are stones in the same building. We are priests in the same temple. We are citizens in the same nation. And then verse 11 and 12 are the punchline. The application of that theology. He says... In the light of who you are in Christ Jesus, now live a certain way so that you advertise the greatness of God and attract people to it. Let's pray. 
Lord, we've tried to cover a lot of ground this morning, but we pray that uh, some of these things will stick with us. Help us, Lord, to uh, deal with those things that build walls and help us to be people who build bridges. So apply these things to our hearts and minds, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just conclude with a song.
Mercy all, immense and three, for oh my God, it found out me. Let's conclude with a prayer, shall we? Lord, thank you that we are indeed the children who belong to you. Living stones in your building. Priests, Lord, in the same temple. Citizens in the same nation. Lord, all the privileges of ours are because of your mercy. It found out me. Praise you again, Lord, for your goodness to us. May these words be uh, helpful, encouraging to each and every one of us. Bless us, we pray, as we depart now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.